important um, uh, in terms of a field that's relatively new and um, and what it affords, I think, uh, the, the community at large, um, and also neuroscience. I mean, I think there's a lot to be gained in the field of pain, um, and a lot of interesting uh, pushes nationally in the NIH and whatnot to, to try to get folks interested in studying pain because it's such a large problem um, in, the, in the country right now. So um, we talk about pain, um, I, Simply stated, uh, there are two different types, um, very simply stated, uh, but there's an acute pain. So that's, everybody knows what that is. You know, you've uh, been walking, you step on a nail, right? Um, you get that sharp reaction of pain, and that is actually fairly protective, okay? I mean, that's, that's a signal to you that there's something wrong, that you've hurt yourself. You need to protect yourself. You need to retract from the pain itself. Uh, fire, putting your hand on the stove, you pull, pull your hand back. There are cases where there are individuals that have no sensory perception for pain, and their sh lifespan is very, very short. I mean, if you can imagine, mm -hmm. if you, you don't even know that you've got your hand caught in a door, or that you've put your hand on top of a stove and you're cooking your skin, your ability to live uh, and avoid danger and injury is very, very short. That is a true phenomenon in some folks, and those folks barely live to the age of adulthood, okay, because they, they just don't know when they're hurting. They can break all kinds of bones, have all types of injuries. So pain is protective in a lot of ways. It could say, and after you've had some tissue damage, right, you know, broken an arm or cut your skin, a gun infection, it's a signal to you to take care of it, seek help, you know, avoid that um, injury, that insult ever again, right? So <clears throat> that inflammatory uh, portion, that short time is there to also signal to you. But what happens when that signal never goes away or changes into a problem where your brain is changed, your central nervous system is changed, and you never stop hurting, and the damage is, is done? In that instance, it's a chronic disease state, and that's um, a chronic disease state just like multiple sclerosis or... Um, Parkinson's disease, it's a, it's, a, it's a disease state that never goes away uh, uh, as of now. Okay, the brain changes, um, everything changes. Uh, portions of your brain die off, die off you know, the executive uh, function portion of the brain that you were just talking about right now, that, that portion dies off. So you can't make decisions anymore. There's the, people call it the fog of pain. Um, I don't know if folks in here have ever had a migraine or anything like that. We have several uh, migraine uh, yeah, nerves or, here. Uh, so, uh, you know, a migraine, um, how much can you get done when you have a migraine? Absolutely nothing, right? I mean, you can't, you can't really even get out of bed. And so these folks may have a migraine. It's a different uh, pathological situation, but in your back, in your legs, orthopedic problems and whatnot. So this problem of chronic pain across the country now is uh, when the Institute of Medicine in 2011 looked at this problem, um, talking about a $635 billion annual problem in the United States. So if you look at some of the disease states like heart disease and cancer and diabetes, some of the most common, most prevalent uh, chronic disease states in the country, you add those all up together in terms of lost wages and medical expenditures, they don't even equal to chronic pain. Okay, so now the nation, on the federal level, federal level NIH and whatnot, um, are dumping money into this problem because they realize it's costing the system so much money. Okay, so what what, what can we do about that? Now, so we know it's a big problem, but at the same time, you probably know of the prescription drug abuse problem, right? I mean, it's very common in Knox County. We lead the state in terms of prescription drug abuse per capita, number of pills per capita in the state, number of deaths now because of uh, prescription drugs in the state. Just go down across the street, go over to East Tennessee's Children's Hospital. There, it's a huge wing now that they're expanding out for neonatal abstinence abuse. Okay, so women who have children that are born um, uh, addicted and physically dependent on pills, right? A huge new wing out there, about 16 beds. You talk to the neonatologist over there. They're steadily becoming the world's, our nation's expert on treating neonatal abstinence abuse. So we have this problems with pills because back in the day we thought 
well, we're gonna treat chronic pain, we just give more narcotics out to everyone. We realized that was a problem that has its own set of um, sequelae and issues and bad, bad things that go on. Okay, so Knox County leads the state. East Tennessee leads the country per capita. We're number two in the country for prescription drug abuse problems. Okay, so in Knox County has more pain clinics than any county in the, in the state. We have about 30 plus pain clinics. And if you count the surrounding counties from here to Morristown, 70 pain clinics. It's crazy. So it's a, so we're talking about whether or not opioids and all of that really treat pain. Um, and it's controversial. Okay, so what is chronic pain management then? Okay, so I'm an anesthesiologist, right, by training, did a year of fellowship. Uh, to do pain training. Pain training or pain management is multidisciplinary, okay? So <clears throat> when you're talking about the crossroads of psychology and neuroscience, um, in my personal biased opinion, there's no better place than pain, okay? Because when you're talking about pain and what it does to the brain, not only does it change the portions of the brain, how you sense and feel pain, but it also changes the emotional centers of the, of the brain, you know that. Okay, so there's certain, if you stick patients in a functional MRI, um, you scan their brain and you take a look at what's going on, the hippocampus, the amygdala, um, other portions of the periaqual ductal gray uh, uh, portions of the brain, all light up, um, and um, especially the emotional centers, anxiety, depression, super common, okay, and pain. And, and what that means, clinically, what I see are quote unquote crazy people. And, and, and it's not that they're crazy, uh, inherently, it's a lot of times the pain is driving people to be depressed, anxious. I mean, if you, uh, those folks who've had migraines and you've had a migraine that does not go away for several days or if you just continue on, on and on and on, I mean, you kind of feel a little hopeless and anxious and, you know, really down and out about yourself. I mean, and the thing is, is that you've got a back injury, okay, someone who has been uh, pain-free for all of their life. They were driving their car, they were smashed by some, uh, you know, truck, uh, orthopedic issues with pins and screws and uh, maybe, you know, spinal cord injury or whatever it is, their life is never quite the same, right? That one event may be uh, as a result of, um, that can have a lot of psychological sequela. They, were, they can never regain their life again. They can never be that same person they were pre-injury sometimes PTSD say, you know, you have uh, our veterans out there who are in harm's way, um, you know, IED explosions or, you know, whatever type of injury that they've had, they're never quite the same again. Uh, young men and young women who are fit and strong uh, in a blink of an eye, they're, they're disabled, okay, and they hurt all the time. And how do you treat that? Okay, so it, it takes sometimes a lot of psycho psychologists to help out with that. It also takes medical techniques in order to help some of those folks. You know, surgeries, but there's a ton of minimally invasive procedures. That's how I got interested in it. In it. So what we call neuromodulation is a really hot area in the world of pain where it, it takes a lot of uh, uh, biomedical engineering to, to make devices that stimulate the brain, the spinal cord, um, to change the perception of pain. So instead of having this pain down the leg that hurts all the time, you stick a spinal cord stimulator lead in someone's back, it's just an epidural placement under x-ray guidance, um, and this stimulator will stimulate the spinal cord, and instead of hurting all the time, you feel this nice vibration. And now, they have different frequencies where you don't even feel the vibration, pain actually goes away, um, and without any type of sens uh, sensation at all to replace, because some people find the sensation kind of distracting. Um, <clears throat> so. The, in the world of neuromodulation is placing uh, snail venom and uh, morphine or uh, baclofen um, can, can be a, a useful adjunct of medication for uh, intrathecal de delivery, which is basically medication in the spinal cord itself to, to bathe the, uh, the spinal cord with, with medications to help folks with pain. Um, you know, medications are also quite helpful. A ton of different minimally invasive procedures and techniques that can also be helpful at the spinal cord level, peripheral nerves, um, and, and other ultrasound d devices, x-rays. Um, a lot of CT-guided um, um, uh, procedures as well. 
So those folks who are really interested in using their hands to help patients, um, this is a great avenue as well for those um, to be interested in this particular field. Um, also, function. Okay, it's not about the world of medicine is now changing in terms of research. It, you know, there's so much that we can do for the patient as far as the medicine or procedure or whatever. Okay, but when you have a our 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 population is getting heavier and bigger. Um, we're not changing behaviors and patterns. Smoking um, can lead to chronic um, pain uh, symptoms. Um, and also obesity, and you know, so we can do as much as we can to help those patients on our end with procedures, but if we allow patients to continue on with their poor lifestyle, well, it's really just not, not really helping the patient out in the long term to uh, manage their pain themselves. So self-management skills with occupational therapy, psychology, and physical therapy to get people up and moving. Um, pain can be treated by your own exercise. Um, you have endogenous opioids, okay, the opioids that you, you create in your own bo uh, body. Endogenous cannabinoids um, in your body. So the runner's high um, is uh, also uh, because, you know, you have little marijuana receptors <laughs> in, your, in your body. Dancing uh, in your brain. Kids, kids. <laughs> but uh, uh, but that, that, can, uh, the, the, that can have some analgesic effect and also be a kind of a self-reward for you know, movement and, and exercise and, and whatnot. Um, there's a lot of other self-management skills that are quite interesting. Mindfulness, um, <clears throat> cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, if you engage folks in this type of work, behavioral work, uh, mindfulness is this incredibly powerful uh, practice. Um, and we've been working with a, a, a nurse, nurse scientist, um, a cognitive psychologist, uh, Experimenter, I guess yeah, Fidel. Uh, uh, yeah, Fidel's there. Wake Forest, who is doing a lot of mindfulness work and realizing that mindfulness is like mental gym, and you can rebuild those portions of the brain that have been affected, um, the emotional centers, anxiety, and, and mindfulness can attenuate some of the anxiety responses uh, to pain, and it may actually rewire the brain to be more robust in terms of. Um, fighting off pain, you know, they, there are these, you know, anecdotes of these monks who've had, you know, hundreds of hours of practice and you stick electrodes to them, you zap them and shock them and, you know, they, their actual pain response is much lower than everyone else's. And um, so now the, the work uh, we're trying to do is to see if the chronic pain state can be improved as a result of mindfulness work. Um, and. Uh, so um, it's pretty exciting stuff. Um, a lot of NIH research. So if any of you guys are interested in um, either the research end of this or the actual clinical applications in the psychology world or, or medical science, there, you know, right now uh, in terms of grants and funding and this drive towards the national cultural transformation on how to treat pain, it's now. Um, and so. Um, it's a great, great time to be excited about it, um, uh, and uh, we we love it. Uh, and uh, we're trying to engage more more young minds into the world of pain because it's so important. It's such a huge national problem. Mm -hmm. uh, Population is getting older, so that predisposes you to more pain and whatnot. So uh, appreciate the opportunity yeah. to talk. So, so you're.